And so now we can get back to our geologic history. Now out of this 4.6 billion years, it's really only the last 542 million years for which we have a good fossil record of the forms of animal life that we can recognize. And this is the time that we call the Phanerozoic. You can't really read it here. It actually says Phanerozoic right there. But since you can't read that, I wrote it over here. The zoic part of Phanerozoic comes from animal life, like the zoo. And Phaneros is the Greek word meaning visible. So the Phanerozoic, or the last 542 million years, is the period for which we have animal life that's documented for us in the fossil record. And we're going to detail the Phanerozoic in the next video, but what we want to talk about here is that long period of time from 4.6 billion years right up until the start of the Phanerozoic at 542 million years. And this is the time that comes before the Cambrian. The Cambrian is this orange period right here. And so this whole time before the Cambrian is called the Pre-Cambrian. It says that right here, but again, you can't read it, so I'll write it out for you. And the Pre-Cambrian has long been sort of an enigma. The fossil record for this time is quite sketchy, at least in terms of traditional fossils. There were no large animals or large plants that could be buried to undergo the various processes required for fossil preservation. Now, as we saw in the previous video, we've gotten pretty good at interpreting evidence provided by the geologic record, for example, and recreating the continental configurations and global climate over the ages. But knowing what the climate was isn't enough to say anything about what kind of life was around, or even if there was any life at all. For that, we'll need fossils. Now, we'll get to those in a bit, but first, let's name the three eons comprising the Precambrian. So the Hadean period this is right here. Hadean, Eon, is named after Hades, the Greek god of hell, or maybe the place hell, which was also called Hades. The earth had freshly formed from the materials ejected in the death of the star that was there before our sun. And as you might imagine, this was a pretty violent time, with lots of volcanic activity and heavy bombardment by other space masses. One of those early impacts, by a body probably as large as the planet Mars today, produced a large amount of material ejected in the Earth's orbit that resulted in the formation of our own moon. If a Mars-sized space rock smashed into the Earth today, it would be basically the end of nearly all life. This heavy bombardment period lasted up through around 3.85 billion years ago. And from a biological standpoint, there's really not much to talk about from the Hadean Eon. The general presumption is that during this violent period, there would be no chance for cellular life to originate. So the Archean lasts from the end of the late heavy bombardment, roughly 3.8, 3.85 billion years ago, to uh, 2.5 billion years ago, more or less, 2.5, which marks the beginning of the Great Oxygenation, at which time the Earth's atmosphere changes from being largely anoxic with oxygen gas, O2, being largely absent, to one over here in the Proterozoic where oxygen is present, at least in appreciable amounts. Now the things to know about the Archean is that this is the time in which we have the unequivocal evidence for the existence, and hence the origin, of cellular life on Earth. The earliest good fossils come from rocks in Western Australia, maybe South Africa too, but in Western Australia we've got these rocks that have been radiometrically dated to 3.5 billion years. And the structures to know about here are called stromatolites, which are sort of many reef-like things made up of many layers of sediments and organic layers, kind of like a geological lasagna. The organic part comes from photosynthetic microbes, presumably, and stromatolites are widely known throughout the fossil record, though mostly in the Precambrian, because once we get to the Phanerozoic out here, uh, those stromatolite-producing communities were presumably demolished by foraging animal life. Um, but in certain locations, though, uh, stromatolites continue to persist, and even today you can find stromatolites still being made by bacterial mats in places like Shark Bay in Western Australia. So while it's conceivable that non-biological processes could generate stromatolite-like structures in super-ancient rocks, the validity of these 3.5 billion-year-old stromatolites as fossils is supported not only by the opinions of many experts, who consider the structures of these stromatolites as only being explainable by ancient life. We also have microscopic cellular imprints 
in a form of organic chemical signature present in these structures. So these ancient stromatolites really have been scrutinized many times over, and the consensus is overwhelming that they are the remains of living cellular organisms. Now when we talk about chemical signatures, we could be meaning a lot of things, but the one we're referring to here is called delta-13C. I'm going to start off by showing you three forms of carbon. Carbon-12, carbon-13, and carbon-14. Carbon-12, or 12C, is the most common form of carbon. The 12 is the atomic mass, which is the number of protons and neutrons in the nucleus. 12C has six of each, but 13C, or carbon-13, has a slightly heavier isotope. It's got seven neutrons instead of six, and it represents about 1.109% of all carbon atoms. Okay. So uh, if you take all carbon atoms in the, uh, in the, on Earth, you would have a known proportion of carbon-13 altogether. Now here's the key issue. Biogenic processes like photosynthesis that pull carbon out of the surrounding physical world and incorporate the carbon into the chemical structure of biomass, these processes strongly favor carbon-12. A much lower proportion than 1.109% of 13C gets incorporated into biological material. So if you were to sample the carbon atoms in your fingernail, you would find a much lower percentage of 13C than 1.109%. And this is measured by the delta 13C, that's this thing up here, delta 13C. And, um, right, uh, see the squiggly line, delta 13C. And the delta 13C is basically the difference between the actual 13C content and the expectation of 1.109%. This is going to be a negative value for carbon-containing matter of biological origin. For example, the sample from your fingernail would be around a negative 20. On the other hand, carbon-bearing material that's not of biological origin would have the same ratios of carbon 13 and carbon 12 that you would find represented in all carbon put together, and so the delta 13C value would be close to zero. So when you get a fossil with bits of graphite, which is basically the carbon left over from the body of the organism, you can test the carbon isotope composition of the graphite. A negative value for delta 13C indicates biological origin, whereas a value close to zero might suggest that it's not a true fossil, that some kind of non-biological process gave rise to the structure. The Australian stromatolites showed enough of the delta 13C to support the claim very strongly that it was biological rather than of abiotic origin. We also used delta 13C to detect events that caused changes in the Earth's atmosphere, and this is frequently associated with mass extinctions. For example, there's a negative carbon 13 excursion going on right now. Carbon in the atmosphere has less carbon-13 than what we would normally expect, and this is due to the widespread combustion of fossil fuels by our species, humans. All of the carbon content of coal and petroleum is of biological origin and is rich in carbon-12 and relatively poor in carbon-13. So by burning fossil fuels, we're putting in an abundance of this 13C poor carbon into the atmosphere, and the result is a negative 13C excursion. The organisms living in the Archean eon were exclusively prokaryotic, or bacteria-like, in lacking complex cell structure. Many were, in fact, bacteria, but to be perfectly accurate, we need to recognize two domains of life, both prokaryotic, one being the bacteria and the other the archaea. Now, in this case, we have the unfortunate convergence of practically two identical terms meaning different things in the same discussion. The Archean Eon is the period of time spanning 3.85 billion years to 2.5 billion years. The Archaea, on the other hand, is one of three domains of life, and Archean forms of life are very similar to bacteria in lacking complex cell structure, although they're completely unrelated to true bacteria. Both bacteria and archaea were present and thriving and diversifying throughout the entire Archean Eon although the details of their early evolution are entirely obscured by their small size and also how long ago it was that this evolution took place. We do know a few things, however, and one of the most crucial bits for us is the evolution of oxygenic photosynthesis. 
basically what plants do today, which is to use sunlight as the energy source to split water molecules into energetic electrons, which can then be used to convert carbon dioxide into organic carbon, or biomass. Now in the process, they produce oxygen gas, O2, and they release this as a waste product. The earliest cyanobacterial fossils, and basically the cyanobacteria belong to the group bacteria, the earliest cyanobacterial fossils come from the latest part of the Archean, and it's the oxygen released by these cells, mostly the cyanobacteria, that resulted in the great oxygenation, which marks the transition between the Archean and the Proterozoic eons, starting at around 2.5 billion years ago. Now the evidence for this particular change doesn't involve fossils, but rather a different form of geologic evidence, known as banded iron formations. Now these are abundant, beginning with the start of the Great Oxygen event, 2.5 billion years, and lasting through around 1.8 billion years ago. Iron is the most abundant element by mass in the Earth. In the absence of oxygen, iron is relatively soluble in water. So throughout the Archean, in which there was effectively no oxygen, this iron would have remained in solution in the Earth's oceans. However, with any significant pulses of oxygen production, such as by the cyanobacteria, some of that iron would form rust, which would then settle out on the bottom, creating a layer of iron oxide-rich black layers, alternating with lighter colored iron pore shales and other sedimentary rocks forming during the less oxygenated times in between the pulses of oxygen. Now this happens over and over again until the iron content in the ocean is all gone. And then from that point, you have mostly iron pore sediments on top of this layer of banded iron. The fact that these banded iron formations occur worldwide in Precambrian sedimentary rocks from about this window of a half billion years in the geologic record tells the story of this change in atmospheric chemistry, which is the main thing separating the Archean Eon from the Proterozoic Eon. Through most of the Proterozoic, shifts towards greater levels of atmospheric oxygen took place very gradually and it's the next significant swing upwards in oxygen level that resulted in the explosion of animal life diversity seen with the start of the Phanerozoic. During the Proterozoic, however, there are a couple of significant events taking place. One is the origin of eukaryotic cells, our third domain, the eukarya. The kind of cells that both you and I and a turnip are made of. Prior to the great oxygenation, all life is presumed to be either archaeal or bacterial. Sometime after 2.5 billion years ago, we see the origin of a larger cell with enclosed nuclei and intracellular organelles like mitochondria and chloroplasts. The salient fossils are called acrotarchs, which are microscopic organic shells of unicellular things, generally eukaryotic things. So the first appearance of acrotarchs in the fossil record gives us an indication of when eukaryotic cells first evolved. Through the Proterozoic and into the Phanerozoic, we see a major diversification of eukaryotes, giving rise to many lineages of organisms, including the ones ultimately producing animals and plants. And it's also during the Proterozoic, albeit towards the end, that we see some of the coldest times in the planet's history, with at least a couple of periods in which the Earth was covered with up to five kilometers of ice for tens of millions to hundreds of millions of years. Life during this time would have had to persist under the ice with very, very low oxygen levels. If you're interested in this part of the Earth's history, just Google Snowball Earth. But what happens around 600 million years ago, when the ice finally breaks up, that's where things start getting interesting for biologists. It's in the last few tens of millions of years of the Proterozoic, the Ediacarian period, where the fossil record shows a strange and unfamiliar array like this Dickinsonia. There's nothing like it still alive today, so we're limited to total speculation about what it is or what it did. Then at the end of the Ediacarian, all this variety of life went extinct, also at a time that corresponds to a very substantial negative 13C excursion, suggesting a worldwide mass extinction. In the years to follow, the Ediacarian biota was quickly replaced by the kinds of animal life that do look familiar to us today arthropods and mollusks and echinoderms shortly to be joined by the earliest vertebrates. And this all happened during the Cambrian, which is the first period of the Paleozoic, which is the first era of the Phanerozoic Eon. 
from that point onward, we have a pretty good fossil record for animal life, although it's definitely a record that's biased in favor of animals that have durable and heavy body parts. We'll talk again about this preservational bias when we get to plant fossils. So in the context of a class focusing largely on the biology of plants, you might ask, well, if the animals of the Cambrian are doing so well, they had to have been eating something, so the plants are already there, right? Well, yes and no. Certainly it's true that there were some photosynthetic plants, and notice the air quotes, that were there at the bottom of the food chain, but we'd be talking about things like cyanobacteria and unicellular and some multicellular green algae and red algae, and these don't really qualify as part of the kingdom plantae which applies only to the evolutionary descendants of the first plants to come up onto dry land. And that doesn't happen until the Ordovician, which is the second period of the Paleozoic, coming right after the Cambrian. To summarize, we've got three eons in the Precambrian. The Hadean, during which conditions were too violent for life to exist. The Archean, during which prokaryotic cellular life flourished and diversified. And then the Proterozoic, during which eukaryotic life originated, and also during which time the Earth fell into a very long period of recurrent planet-wide glaciations. Apart from these facts of what happened over the course of the Precambrian, we also spent some time addressing the evidence. Stromatolite fossils, 13 sea excursions, and banded iron formations. And in the next video, we're going to be doing a similar overview of the geologic timeline, this time focusing on the Phanerozoic.